us pray. Father, Lord God, we just want to bless your name because the entrance of your word gives light. I ask, oh Lord God, even that you prepare the hearts of your people so that they will receive your word and it shall become flesh to them, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, glorify your name in our presence today. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Once again, I want to welcome you to today's service. Um, we will continue on the topic, stepping into your season of fruitfulness. Our text is um, John 12, 24. Most assured, they are to you. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Today, I believe that we are coming closer to the end of this particular series. I'm not sure whether this will be the last time, but because I don't know how the, how the Lord is leading. Sometimes in the past, I thought, oh, okay, let's let's bring this to a close. And then God will just <coughs> pour the whole thing again. And it's like, start receiving revelations. And it's like, I know that ah, God wants me to continue. So for now, this might be the last one. And I want to talk on the topic guidelines for fruitfulness. Guidelines for fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is an attribute of the spiritually mature because only the mature have the capacity to maximize their fruitfulness. You know, the reason why is like, is like when you plant a crop, let's say a tree crop, it doesn't start producing fruit the same day that you plant it. First, it will have to grow trunks, it will have to grow branches, and then it cannot start flowering, and then it cannot start bearing fruit. If the branches and the trunks that support it are not there, there is no way that that animal will be able to sustain the fruit. Everything will just be on the ground. So, fruitfulness is first about building capacity. The ability to be able to hold on to your fruit, to be able to enjoy it, to be able to bring it forth. Nature teaches us that fruitfulness is the hand that we walk towards. And it's therefore seldom achieved very early in life. When our energies are devoted towards the necessary growth that prepares the ground for our fruitfulness. You know that all of us, we are born with the capacity to be fruitful. But we don't just become fruitful as babies. It takes time. We grow, we mature, we achieve puberty. We, is that we, we become responsible adults. Then we know that we are ready to start our family. So even though we had all these things within us, it is only when we are ready, our time has come, that we start becoming fruitful. So maturity is about responsibility. When you are responsible, you get to make your own decisions and to also bear the consequences of your actions, as well as reap the fruit of your labor. It is when in the eyes of the law, you attain the age of accountability, meaning that you can no longer hide behind someone else. That, ah, you, can, you can't hide behind your father anymore or behind your mother. You now have to face the responsibility for your actions. In the spiritual sense, we become mature when you are able to rightly divide the word of truth and deal with God in understanding. When it's like God is able to direct you using his word. When you're able to know the mind of God because you understand what he is stating in his word, that's when your maturity starts coming forth. So when you are already spiritually mature and accountable and can thus bear spiritual responsibility, what you then need to what you then need to point you in the right direction of maximize fruitfulness are guidelines that you can follow to enable you to reach your goal of fruitfulness hence our topic today is fruitfulness guidelines fruitfulness guidelines what are the things that you can do that will more or less guarantee you the fruitfulness that God has promised in his word. You know, when you, it's like, for example, when you have like a guide dog, for example, 
A guide dog is the eye of the, to the blind. Even though the blind cannot see where they are going, as long as they have the, the blind dog who is already trained leading them, they know that they won't is that they won't miss the way. So lines that God has placed is, is drawn in the sand for us, so that we are able to follow those lines from where we are to where we need to be and in terms of fruitfulness. That's what we want to discuss today. So we start by first deciding, de de defining what a guideline is. A guideline is a general rule, a principle, or a piece of advice. According to Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia, a guideline is a statement by which to determine a course of action. A guideline aims to streamline particular processes according to a set routine or sound practice. When you have guidelines, you know what to expect or what is expected of you. You know what you need to do because you've already been told this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do, and this is what we can expect when you do this. Guidelines may be issued by and used by any organization to make the action of its employees or divisions more predictable and presumably of higher quality. So God gives us his guidelines because he wants us to be maximally fruitful, much fruitful, than just existing like single seeds who are not as fruitful as we ought to be. So a guideline is similar to a rule. So in the case of fruitfulness guidelines, there are rules that you can follow so that you can become fruitful. So instead of thinking of fruitfulness as being something that is abstract, you can now tie fruitfulness to particular issues, to particular ways of behaviors that will enable you to know that when I'm doing this, this is what I can expect. Guidelines are like preordained paths that are designed to guide people to an expected end. They are a set of proclamations designed to lead to a predefined end. And they therefore serve the purpose of giving direction, which when followed would lead to a specific and envisaged end. A guideline for fruitfulness therefore does what it says on the thing, on the thing. It encourages us to adhere to the dictates of the word of God and will not only make us fruitful, but also help in maximizing our fruitfulness. In finding characteristics of guidelines, or the characteristics, sorry, not characteristics, the defining characteristic of guidelines is that they can only be issued by those qualified by previous experiences to know what to expect in order to help those who would use it that currently lack requisite experience to achieving their goal. For example, if I'm going to give you guidelines, it must be because I know what I'm talking about. So guidelines are things that are derived from your experiences. I want to go to a place or you want to go to a place where it's like I have been to or I know the place very well. I can tell you when you get to A, turn right, or don't do this, then do this, and then do this, and then you get here. I can say that because I have been through it. So for anyone to give any guideline to anybody, they must have the requisite experience. The objective is to make life easier for those aspiring to achieve what some have already achieved. That you can learn from your own experience or you can learn from the experience of others. Learning from the experience of others is usually the less costly way of learning because they would have paid the price that you, that you can avoid repeating just by taking cognizance of and leveraging their mistakes and trials. You know, it was um, Einstein who said the man who has never made, made any mistake 
I have never attempted anything. What that tells us is that part of learning is making mistakes. <clears throat> if you are going to start learning something afresh, you will make many mistakes before you eventually get where you need to get to. That is the price you pay for being the pioneer of acquire, acquiring knowledge. But if you have paid that price, and I want to now learn what you have learned, I don't need to pay the same price. So you can learn from others. Learning from your own mistake while instructive can also be personally costly. Hence, learning from others' experiences can prove very costly, a very cost effect for you. You learn the most, but at the least cost to you. When we talk about the Word of God, it's about the experiences of others. When you know what happened to somebody because they did this, that tells you, don't do it. And when you know when there's a positive repercussion, then you know, ah, this is what I need to do. Why? Because you've learned from them. You've seen the cost that they paid. Also, the best people to give guidelines are those who have faced the challenges that we are contemplating and they have triumphed. Why is this important? It is because those who are falling short in their own experiences often lack the quality required to succeed in that endeavor. If you want to learn something, don't go and learn it from somebody who has never made it because they will infect you with their failure mentality. So when somebody gives you guidelines, you better look into their lives and say, this thing that you are asking me to do, did it work for you? And if you know that ah, it's working for them or it worked for them, you can now say, okay, all right, I will, I, will, I will follow it. But if people say, ah, well, this is the right one, but it hasn't worked for me, better go for somebody that it is working for. Because if it does not work for them, what is the guarantee that it will work for you? So whoever issues guideline, you need to understand that they have to be is like a winners in, the, in, in their own right. Those who have not succeeded, they may be able to give guidelines, but they can only tell you of their failures. You still have to work towards turning that failure into the success that you want it to be. So people, you have to be careful that whoever is advising you, giving you guidelines for your life, is like their mentality is not defeatist. Because if you follow their guidelines, you will end up the way they too they ended up being unsuccessful. The reality is that you cannot give what you do not have. And success can only breed success. And you know what? Failure also breeds failure. So treasure the advice of those who have attempted and succeeded at what you are contemplating. Because you know that, you know what? Because they know what it takes to win and they offer the best path to fullness for you. One such person who was a winner and so understood what is required to win in the race of life is Apostle Paul. He was therefore eminently qualified to offer guidelines about how we can successfully run a spiritual race and win to the glory of God. His recipe for success is short and sweet, but also deep, meaning that it is important for us to understand the mind of God in order to leverage his word for our maximized fruitfulness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 23, Paul wrote, Rejoice always. Pray without season. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. 
if you take each of those points by themselves, they represent your guideline to fruitfulness. According to Apostle Paul, you can guarantee yourself maximize fruitfulness by taking the following itemized steps. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. That's the first item on, on, on the guideline that God has issued to us. That if you want to be fruitful, you must learn to rejoice always. You know that that's not naturally possible. That you can rejoice always. So it is a learned process, a learned habit. This means leading a life controlled by joy. Joy, as we know, is a segment of the fruit of the Spirit, which means that not subject to our external circumstances, but governed by our internal environment. Joy is the fruit of the outworking of the Holy Spirit in us that confirms His presence with us and in us. No, joy love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, goodness, kindness. Those are segments. Like, just imagine orange. You can't have a segment of orange without having the whole fruit. So that's why it is called the fruit of the spirit, not fruits of the spirit. Everything is mingled together. So that if you can have love, then you have joy, you have peace, you have patience, you have goodness, you have kindness. So when the Bible says we should rejoice always, that joy is the outworking of the Holy Spirit within you. Joy is different from happiness. Happiness is subject to our environment. When something good happens, you are happy. When something bad happens, you are sad. But joy is such that whether it is good, whether it is bad, you always have the joy of the Lord within you. It makes you immune to what is around you and more focused on God. Joy is the assurance we have that God will cause all things to work together for our good. When you know that even the worst experience you may face is ultimately working together for your good, then you don't allow it to depress you. You look at it and say, God, I'm going to experience your greatness even from this. You, you can rejoice. The Bible says rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice because your joy is your strength. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So it is that joy that will keep you strong. It is that joy that the devil wants to steal from you. Because once it can succeed in stealing your joy, you become vulnerable to other attacks. It can then load you with anxiety. It can load you with disillusionment. It can load you with despair. It can load you with depression. And finally, it will quench you and destroy you. So joy is your defense against the attack of the enemy. When the enemy comes and attacks you, thinking, ah, yes, I'm going to make him cry. And you, yes, you cry, but you are also praising God. I say, Father, Lord God, though weeping endures at night, I have every confidence that joy is coming in the morning. I may be down, I'm not out. I may be down, I'm not dead, because the Lord is my strength. He will take control of my situation. That is joy. That is number one guideline. If you are going to be fruitful, don't allow the enemy to steal your joy. He will try. He will do everything possible to frustrate you. But as long as you've got your joy, that is your guarantee, your deposit of the fact that God, God's deliverance is coming soon and you will experience it. So when you have the joy of the Lord overflowing through you, it means that your faith, fruitfulness is all but guaranteed. So let me ask you, how joyful are you feeling today? Have you just woken up with all these complaints in your mind? 
I want to encourage you to rejoice in the Lord. The thing about rejoicing is that, you see, there are different kinds of rejoicing. There is rejoicing under duress and there is rejoicing in celebration. When you rejoice in obedience to God under duress, you set yourself up to rejoice in celebration after God has tackled that issue that's causing you to weep. Abacock said, though the fig tree does not blossom and there are no cattle in the store, though the fruit of the holy fields and there's just destruction and trouble everywhere, he said, regardless of this, I will still praise the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord, my God, of my salvation. In an agrarian society, what Abacock was describing was total disaster. Yet he says, look, I may be out. God is on the throne. I need you to understand that whatever you are going through, don't ever forget that God is on the throne. He will glorify his name in your life. He will do great and mighty things that you may be down now, but you are not out. He says that though there is a pressing down, you shall declare, ah, there is a lifting up. Why? Because joy allows your life to be spring-loaded. You know what spring-loaded means? It means that, you know, when, when you have something that has spring under it, and you push it down, and you push it down, and you push it down to the extent that it's like, it may even seem flat. The moment you release your hands, that thing will just bounce up again. That is your life. Things may seem difficult at this point in time. You may seem to be out of it, out of the race. People have already condensed and consigned you to history. Say, oh, there is nothing good that can come here. I need to encourage you that you need to regain the joy of the Lord in your life. Because that can only prepare you for the great things that God wants to do and accomplish in your life. So the first thing you must make sure you've got and you hold on to, that is one of the guidelines, is the joy of the Lord. Rejoice always. Number two, pray without season. There is a modern acronym for this particular instruction. It is called PUSH. P-U-S-H. It means pray until something happens. Pray without season. Pray until something happens. Fruitfulness is not the hallmark of those who give up midway, but the preserve of those who persevere to the end. Brethren, when the Bible says that we should pray without season, it's alluding to the fact that we are in spiritual warfare. So we need to fight the battle of faith. We need to fight against principalities, against powers, against the of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Why? So that the kingdom of God shall come and his will be done in our lives. So why do we have to pray without ceasing? Because not all answers to prayers manifest immediately. Some do, but most don't. And I'm sure you've experienced it. It is not every prayer that you've ever prayed in your life that receives manifestation immediately. Some would, even some before you pray, the answer has manifested. And you say, ah, but I only just prayed two seconds ago. But some, you pray and pray and pray. 20 years, you are still praying. In whatever category you may fall to, or whatever may be your current experience, the guideline to fruitfulness says, pray without season. Pray until something happens. Pray until God answers. Don't give up. Don't give in. Just press it. Just press on. Because that is how you will be fruitful. 
when you pray without ceasing, it means that you have to keep at it until you either see the manifestation of your prayer or you receive assurance that God has had and God will do, he will grant you your request in due course. You see, there are two ways to know whether your, your prayers are answered. The first one is when God shuts your mouth and says, hey, shut up, this is the answer. In that case, you don't need to pray anymore. You just, oh, I thank you, Lord God, because I'm enjoying this. The other way is when God says, yes, I've answered your prayer, but you have to wait for it to manifest. That one can be tough, but it's made easier. When you receive, it's like your faith titled it. See, faith means, his faith is for today. Hope is for tomorrow. When you pray concerning one thing, the fact that it has not mani- it, it doesn't manifest immediately does not mean that God has not heard you. What you need to hear from God is God saying, yes, I've said yes to it. And you take the assurance of that yes with you wherever you go. So that if anybody asks you, oh, is this situation resolved? Oh, yes, it is resolved. But it's like, we can't see it. No, don't worry, it's coming. Why? Because that is what faith is. Faith is the substance of things or for the evidence of things not seen. When you speak of the end from the beginning, that God has answered your prayers, even though you are still waiting for his manifestation, that is what praying with that season also means. You are, you've prayed, you've received it, you are now expecting it, and you start living as if that answer is coming. So when we talk about praying until something happens or praying without ceasing, this was the kind of importunate prayer. You know, there's something called importunity in prayer. When you don't, you pray and you don't give up. This is the kind, or the kind of importunate prayer modeled by Jacob, who told God, oh, unless you go, unless you bless me, you, can't, you are not going anywhere. So he held on to God until he got his wishes. Daniel also operated this prayer philosophy because he and his friends, they did not relent in their prayers until when the angel of God arrived to deliver the answer to their prayers. And he told them, Daniel, since the first day you were praying, I had you. Yet the answer did not manifest until 20 days later. What that tells you is that if between day one and day 20, Daniel gave up, he would not have received his answer. So what that tells you is that, see, the kind of response you get from God uh, in terms of your prayers is that they are governed by different factors. If, for example, you're asking God for sweet. That is low on the temple of need. God can give it to you. If you're asking God for a city, it may take a few years before those things manifest. Also, if you're asking God for something, the devil may challenge it. And that may cause things to be stressed for a long while until you get it. And sometimes it's God himself testing us, using our experiences to mold our character. So what that tells us is that the God, whatever time it may take for God to answer, our mindset should be, Lord God, if you don't bless me, you too, you will not rest because I will keep crying unto you. The Bible says that give him no rest. When you don't give him rest, God will say, okay, all right, all right, all right. I will, let, 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 I, 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 I will do this for you. And once you have that assurance within you, you know that nothing can stop it from coming. Some answers to prayer will only manifest when both God and us have the understanding that we will not relent until we see a change in our circumstances. 
It is when you are committed to extracting and maximizing your fruitfulness from God that you, you can prize open God's willing hand to release to you what he is eager to give to you. But it won't come cheaply. So uh, pressing to, into God in prayer is the price we pay for something that is not cheap to acquire. God will make you to work for it so that you can value his blessing in your life. You know, you know that, I mean, there's that, there's, there's that saying in my language that whatever it is that you work for holds high value to you. So when God is that doesn't want us to mess his blessing in our lives, he causes it causes us to work for it. And it is by praying, seeking him. Because you know what you've worked for, of course, you, you value very highly. So if you are going to seize your prayer, let it be because God has filled your mouth with the fruit of your labor. Don't stop praying until you experience the greatness of God in your life. As I said, time is fast spent, so we will continue this next time. But today, we've talked about prayer. Next time, we will look at in everything, give thanks for this is the will of the Father for you in Christ Jesus. We will look at do not quench the spirit. Those are part of the guidelines. So this will form part of the first message. We will look at despise not prophecies. We want to understand how the word of God can enable you to become fruitful, either in terms of relationship with this prophet or in, term, in terms of you prophesying over yourself, in terms of you heeding the word of God that has been prophesied over you, how you can turn that into your fruitfulness. Also, we will look at that word, say, test all things. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. But for today, we will just focus on the aspects that we have covered of those guidelines. And we are going to pray that, Father Lord God, as your word has, now I know that if I pray without season, then I am guaranteed your fruitfulness. If I rejoice always, then I am guaranteed is that to end up not being unfruitful. So, Lord God, today, I make that commitment. Even as David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. What he says, God, from now on, I will rejoice always. When now we say that we should pray without ceasing, it means that we will press into God. We will not take a no for an answer for something that his word already assures us. We will refuse to leave God's presence empty-handed. Say, God, until you are ready to bless me, well, you have to keep me company and I'll keep needling you. Because, Lord God, this is what your word assures me and that is what I'm taking with me. So why don't you just pray and say, Father, Lord God, maybe you have issues that you've already given up on. Maybe you are discouraged. You don't know what to do anymore. I'm encouraging you to be encouraged. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Receive this word today and say, Lord God, let that give you the hope for you to press him into God. I say, God, that which I've already given up on, I am retooling myself. I am strategizing. I am holding on to you. Lord, take control in Jesus' mighty name. I will not allow the enemy to steal my joy. Or I will not allow the enemy is that to take away the blessings that you've you, you, it's like you, you, you've made for me. So, Lord God, I yield myself to you today. I commit to walking these guidelines. From today onwards, Lord God, my life shall be full of rejoicing. From today onwards, Lord God, my life shall be full of prayer. Let us pray in Jesus' mighty name. If until now, fruitfulness is an abstract thing to you, 
you don't know how to go from A to B. You've just learned it today. That in any area, whatever, any kind of fruitfulness, and it's like we've defined so many kinds of fruitfulness in the past nearly one year. These are the guidelines that lead you to that kind of fruitfulness. Joy. Joy overflowing in your heart. Prayer never ceasing from your mouth. With faith that will never let go of God's promise. That is how you become fruitful in life. When those two values, when they rule over your life, you can never end up a failure. So why don't you just pray, Father Lord God, I have begun this journey of fruitfulness. May I not fall by the wayside. May I not grow weary and give up. Lord God, strengthen me in the inner man. Give me the grace to fight like a spiritually mature person so that I can see your goodness reflected in my life and your glory tabernacle upon me. Let's pray in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father Lord God, you said in your word that your word is a light unto our feet and lamp to our path. When we walk according to it, the likelihood of, our, of us stepping on snakes, on bottles, or eating our toes against stones becomes reduced. Because, Lord God, you see the light that lights our path. We know where we are going. You have revealed to us through these two guidelines that we understand. So, we have taken responsibility for them. We can't say, ah, it's because we didn't know. That's why we were unfruitful. We now know that rejoicing always is your commandment. We now know never to give up on you, but to grab hold of that which you grabbed hold of us. Lord God, let this knowledge continually ring in our memory, in our psyche, so that whenever we face issues, Lord God, we know, Lord God, that you are with us. Never again shall the enemy steal our joy, because your glory shall tabernacle upon us. Lord, I pray for your children, whatever it is they may be going through at this point in time that is tasking for them. I ask, oh Lord God, Show your greatness and your power through their tribulations in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Prove yourself in their life that you are God, that you are their God, and that you are not ashamed to be called their God before the world. And after you've done it, grant them the grace to come and share the testimony with us so that we all will enjoy your goodness together as a body. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace in fellowship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. Amen. And the Lord give you the grace even to walk by the guidelines that he has taught you. Amen. But in Jesus' mighty name, I'm afraid. 
Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful week. Amen.